All right, so we've got coaching call number two going on. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you here real quick, Perrin. We're going to basically jump back into going over where we left off. How we were talking about brainstorming, and then we're going <laughs> to dive into hopefully some keyword research uh, yeah, great. along the way. So let me uh, share my screen here real quick. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yep, I can see it. Okay, so we're back into our lovely PowerPoint presentation. We've got coaching call number two with Parent tonight. So we um, basically, to, to review where we left off, um, I've still got some of those other slides here. We talked about brainstorming. And you were going to pull up basically 15 to 20 different ideas from these different categories that we talked about. And I know that you did that. Uh -huh. um, and uh, so let's, let's go ahead and just jump right into the list that you put together and some of your thoughts on those. And then we'll dig into how we're going to, to niche those down even more to find uh, specific keywords that meet our criteria. Sure. So um, before I actually pull up the list, maybe tell me how you went about putting together the list itself. Yeah, sure. And I, I think you and I spoke about this today, but it really felt to me almost like a free writing exercise, except for the last section where I was kind of going through my own head um, and or just looking around and coming up with ideas. One of the more interesting things to me, though, was that I, I wasn't or I was least in, interested rather in my own ideas because I spend the most time with those already. Um, so as I was sort of typing this out and thinking about what I would want to write about for 15 or 20 or 50 or 100 articles, um, most of my interest was directed in the things that I didn't know about or the things that I was kind of stumbling across mm -hmm. on the internet. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so yeah, that was, that was kind of my process and something that was a little bit surprising. The keywords that I was coming up with about the frustrations didn't seem as useful as I thought they would be. They just seemed more like like nagging frustrations in my own life, and I didn't see how they would lead to useful information. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. wrinkly, like my first one was wrinkly pants because I hate ironing. And like, <laughs> is there really that much content on like wrinkly pants, you know? So... You, you never know, but not. But I can also see that you know maybe wrinkly pants isn't that interesting either to you. <laughs> right. you know, can you write fifty or a hundred articles on on you know clothing preparation or something? Yeah. So that that actually is an interesting thought though because um, we had you write down the topics that you were interested in, but as you said, you know things like video gaming, you know, is something that you enjoy doing. But are you really interested in writing about that and exploring that through a website? And, and it sounds like you're not really. Uh, and so you, for those listening, um, you did come to me during the week and basically said that. Um, and so I said, well, go through and maybe compile a list of your top 15 or 20 topics that you would be interested in, in writing about or creating a website about. Mm -hmm. um, so let's let's maybe share all of your lists, um, if that's okay. Yeah. I'm going to maybe try to punch all of those right in here into our um, PowerPoint presentation. Um, and I know you sent me an email, or do you have those handy where you can just paste them into Skype? Yep, I have them handy right here. Okay, maybe let's do that, and I'll just copy and paste them over here. All right. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, I've gone through here and uh, pasted in um, all the brainstorming that you did. And uh -huh. so on this first slide that we're looking at here um, was your initial brainstorming topics on things that you're interested in. Um, and I'll let people look at this list and, and I'll paste this in on, on the blog as well. But you've got things like competitive gaming, um, Reddit board games, table tennis, which I enjoy, 
um, extreme races? Um, is that like ultra like, marathons uh, or? Yeah, like Spartan Race, Tough Mudder, the ones where they're yeah. like jumping over fire and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Where they actually try to hurt you. you know, yeah. <laughs> things like that. You know, I had, a, I had an acquaintance that did one of those where they had like live electronic wires like hanging. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you had to like, like jump through them. It's crazy, yeah. And yeah, he like walked away with his left leg numb or something. So. <laughs> He got shocked, but um, yeah, vacationing on Lake Michigan, entrepreneurship. Okay, so some great um, topics. You know, I I'm not going to dig into specifically whether these are good or bad. This isn't really the point where we're deciding whether these are good or bad mm -hmm. um, per se. Um, but this is what you came up with. Those are things that you're interested in. Um, then the other uh, topics, things that you thought were cool that you don't really know anything about. Um, gardening, rock climbing, restoring typewriters, which I thought that was kind of interesting, um, helicopter lessons, building computers, professional go-kart racing, and so on. These are some really um, great ideas. And I, and I actually want to dig in because I, I'm curious how you came up with such a broad range of interesting topics so quickly. And maybe people listening in you know, maybe this is something you're good at because you're a writer, you're used to brainstorming. Um, how did you come up with such a diverse list of interesting uh, things? Yeah, not to toot my own horn, but I think a lot of it is, I mean, I'm a writer by trade and a lot of writing is just the skill of letting go and letting your mind go where it wants to. But also, I try to keep a backlog of things that I've been meaning to try, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so stuff like gardening and rock climbing, like my girlfriend has always been interested in like growing herbs, right? Mm -hmm. And rock climbing, we have a couple really cool rock climbing studios. Um, and then there's some stuff that like I've seen on YouTube that I thought was amazing. And in a perfect life, if I was James Bond, the things that I would do, like mm -hmm. aerobatics is like those little tiny planes that do just like crazy flips and stuff that you like fly yourself. So yeah. Um, so I mean, these are things that. I just always thought are cool, but you know, take a little bit of energy to like personally experience. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the, I mean, it's an awesome list, and I was just curious the thought process of how you came yeah. up with these. Um, sounds like it's just things that you've thought about or kind of kept the log of um, as as you've experienced different things. Um, yeah, I think everybody has those, you know. I mean, yeah. I probably if. If people are following along and this is an exercise, a good way to do it might just be to write on a piece of paper, I've always wanted to blank, and then fill that in for 20 lines. There you go. I like that. So, anybody listening in, I've always wanted to. That's a nice uh, writing exercise to get people thinking. I like that. That's great. And then, frustrations. you got the wrinkly pants we talked about. <laughs> Hey, I hate wrinkly pants too. <laughs> yeah, top of the list. Yeah. <laughs> Morning commute in Chicago. There's probably a lot of people that share that. Uh, same frustration, paying back student loans, bad grammar, misplacing keys and wallet. That's a huge one. Um, at least for me, slow walking pedestrians. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like uh, having a slow walker in front of you, I take it. Huh? Hey, yeah, some of us have things to do, you know. <laughs> Uh, clutter, assembling IKEA furniture, long lines, loading times. I see that you don't like waiting here. Yeah. Um, you related <laughs> no, to waiting. Really, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's true. So, okay, that's good. And then uh, we're also going to just quickly share, and I don't know that people are going to be able to see this very well. I'll zoom in on the video so you can see these, but um, there's a lot of things here. Pet carriers, cat playhouse, watering equipment. Um, plant germination, um, snow thrower accessories, organic chocolate, luxury shaving, fair trade coffee. And so these are all things you just went directly to Amazon.com and, and looked at different categories and products, correct? Yeah, pretty much. And I mean, it's easy to notice here that this is longer. And originally, mm -hmm. we'd planned for 15 to 20 of these also. But as I was doing it, it was first of all fast and easy and also it just intuitively felt like kind of a gold mine mm -hmm. um, just because I mean like there's so many things on Amazon that you would never consider and they just seemed off the wall enough um, 
that they might make good niches. And because it was only taking me a couple seconds to find each one, I just went ahead and, you know, beefed out the list a little bit. Exactly. And I'll add my two cents there because I've gone through a lot of the initial steps that you did, you know, maybe listening, uh, listing interests, you know, things that I knew I was interested in, maybe even some frustrations. But after you've created a few niche sites, you may have gone through all those ideas. Uh -huh. um, and so you need to tap into something else. So if you can't think of anything off of the top of your head, Amazon really is a great place. And there's other you know, sites, eBay or even Wikipedia, you can sort of data mine for different words and phrases there. Um, all, all kinds of places where there's thousands, hundreds of thousands of categories or products that you can just really browse and come up with lots of cool ideas like you did here. So for people that are just feeling brain dead, for whatever reason, like I do a lot of the time, um, you can go over to Amazon and, and pull a, a huge list. Uh, uh -huh. And also, I think I saw this in one of your posts, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think one of the strategies you use is to take one of these broader topics and find a forum and look at the forum post titles. Is that mm -hmm. right? Yep. Yep, I've done that as well. So you can even dig in a little bit deeper to get words and phrases that you wouldn't have thought of. You know, like you've got backyard birding here. I'm sure you could go over to a birding forum and pull all kinds of things that, you know, I wouldn't think of because I'm not into birding, um, where the people on the forum would because that's yeah. what they do. So, no, that's a great, great idea to expand this list even further. Um, and so, really at this point, the next step is to start uh, both expanding this list even bigger into um, a larger list of keywords that potentially lots of people are searching for, and then to start filtering that down based on the search volume that we talked about and, and, and other things as far as low competition and things like that. Mm -hmm. And maybe um, before we move on, just for me, when I was very first starting out, it's like when you think about doing keyword your keyword research, like where do I even start is a big question. And this exercise made it very easy for me to see that it's there are just limitless keywords out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Absolutely. And. You know, I think you've got such a huge list here. I usually don't start off with a list of, you know, 50 C keywords or whatever you have here. Probably a little more than that. Um, you know, usually, I think we talked about this before, but, you know, between 10 and 20, usually I'm able to find a good niche based on that sort of initial <laughs> list of 10 or 20. So, um, as far as more brainstorming, I don't think we need to do any at this point. I think uh -huh. we've got a huge list that we should find certainly at least one good niche that we can go into. Sure. Um, but it may not be this specific keyword. So you've got, um, you know, Cat Playhouse written down here. That might not be the keyword that we eventually go after. Mm -hmm. you know, it might be, you know, um, cheap feline toys might eventually be the keyword we go after. Sure. Um, you know, but, but the Cat Playhouse is going to lead us to that. So mm -hmm. these are all going to lead us somewhere. Um, we don't know quite where just yet. Um, and so that's where uh, keyword tools and uh, more in-depth keyword research come to play. So um, we're going to start keyword tools and uh, research. So again, if I go to our previous PowerPoint slide where we talked about, and I don't know if you can hear the thunder, there's a bit of a thunderstorm yeah. here where I am, <laughs> so yeah, people, can, people can enjoy the uh, thunder and lightning outside my window here, It's <laughs> the way it goes. Um, so for keyword research, our ideal keyword is going to be one that has 5,000 um, or more exact match searches each month, and but we also talked about it can have much less, you know, maybe 1500 a month, as long as there's lots of related long-term keywords. So that's initially where we're going to start, um, is try to find lots of keywords that fit within that criteria as far as search volume. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a couple of really 
there's one primary free tool that people can use that if they don't want to buy any keyword research tools, they can use the Google Keyword uh, Planner. Uh, it used to be called the Google AdWords Keyword Tool. That was sort of uh, ended and it's evolved. And now it's called the Google Keyword Planner. Um, so I actually would like to spend just a minute with you, Perrin, and show you and others the Keyword Planner um, for, for how they can use it for free to do their keyword research. Yeah, great. Does that sound good? Okay. So let's... Yeah, that's... Go ahead. I was going to say, that should be really useful because I've never done keyword research this way, so... There we go. Okay, so I'm over here in the keyword planner, um, the Google Keyword Planner. And this is a free tool that Google provides really for their advertisers, okay? And so that is important to keep in mind. It's They, they want uh, advertisers to use this tool to find keywords that they can bid on um, to advertise on Google.com for. Mm -hmm. um, but we as people trying to rank in Google S for SEO purposes, we can also use this tool because it gives us important data points such as how many times a keyword is searched for every month, uh, how much advertisers are typically paying for that keyword, um, if there's a lot of advertisers or very few advertisers, things like that that actually help us out that are trying to rank naturally within Google. Mm -hmm. um, so I mention that because a lot of people maybe don't understand that perspective that this really is created for advertisers, but we're using it for our purposes here. All right. So just to give an example, let's go over and grab one of your keywords off of your list, and, and maybe let's start with things that uh, you think are cool that you really don't know anything about. Uh -huh. uh, so is there any here that you want to punch in just to take a look at real quick? Um, yeah, let's do helicopter lessons. Helicopter lessons, all right. So, what you do with the keyword planner, you can pop in a keyword there, um, select your country, your language, um, and you can do some other things here as well. But essentially, you just hit get ideas. And as you can see, Google pulls up lots of results very quickly. Um, and if you click on the keyword ideas, it's going to show up to 800 additional keywords based on helicopter lessons, okay? And so, very useful. So it's pulling up 800 ideas based on that one keyword and all of this data here is available. So for helicopter lessons, we can see that it gets an average uh, monthly search volume of 720 searches a month. Um, competition is high and this actually means advertiser competition. How many advertisers are there on Google.com? So if I go over to Google.com and I punch in helicopter lessons I'm going to see, and yes I do, I see lots of ads. So there's ads up here on the top and then all the way on the right hand side. Can you see all that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that's what that column is referring to, is that there's a large amount of advertisers bidding on that particular keyword. Okay, so for SEOs like us, um, having something that says hi actually means that that's perhaps a valuable keyword something that people are paying a lot of money for and most likely there's a lot of money to be made in that niche mm -hmm. okay it does not mean that it's difficult to rank for or that it's easy to rank for it has nothing to do with how difficult or easy it is to rank for within Google does that make sense yeah it makes sense okay and I stress that because I get a lot of people tripped up a lot of people get tripped up on that particular point they think that if it says low, it must be an easy keyword to rank for in Google, and that's just not the case at all. 
um, because this is providing information for advertisers. So then there's the average CPC or the average cost per click. So at these advertisers over here on google.com um, are paying on average every time, if I were to click on this ad, that would have cost them 84 cents that they're mm -hmm. paying to Google. So that's what that means. But that does relate to um, websites that have Google AdSense on their site. So, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find any very quickly, but if I did, you know, if I came in um, and this site had, you know, Google AdSense here, let's just pretend this banner is Google AdSense, um, and I clicked on that, this website would also make some money and it is related to this 84 cent um, number here. It's usually going to be much less, but we can use it to, to look at those with high CPC versus keywords with low CPC. And so those that have higher, we're usually going to make more money per click um, from our Google AdSense ads. Okay, so um, if I can jump in and ask a question real quick. Yeah. When when you say it's it's usually going to be much less, do you mean that when someone clicks on an ad, the amount that the advertiser actually pays is going to be less than the bid because it's only a bid, or do you mean that the percentage that the advertiser actually keeps from that eighty-four cents is less? Well, um, actually both, um, because this particular average CPC is well let's let's click on this question mark um, yes and I just wanted to verify it says um, bids across all ad positions for location and search network um, so it's talking about the search network which is google.com <laughs> um, the content network is is different the content network is uh, sites that have Google AdSense on them okay okay so this number is for the search network on the content network or the amount they're paying to be listed on your site and my site you know Google AdSense is going to be roughly 50 percent or um, there's not an exact number but it's usually going to be you know maybe half okay this amount that they're going to pay um, but also the other part of this is you know so let's say they pay 40 cents um, to be listed on you know parents helicopter training site mm -hmm. helicopter lesson site and you're not actually gonna make the full 40 cents if they pay 40 cents Google is gonna keep um, I believe it's 32 percent of that and you get paid 68 percent okay and I don't know if that was way confusing for people out there listening to pay attention to, but hopefully that made sense. No, yeah, it made sense. It made sense. So okay. just if I can throw it back at you to make sure I understand, um, generally the actual cost per click that somebody will pay to put an advertisement on your niche site will be lower than this estimate. Yes. And of the actual cost per click, you're going to keep 68%. That's exactly right. Okay. Very good. So, you know, if, if we were to just quickly estimate, you know, we might get an actual third of what this 84 cents is. Gotcha. You know, that might be, you know, a quarter or something. Um, 25 cents or 30 cents yeah. might be what we could expect. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and it, it really varies a lot. You know, sometimes there might be advertisers that only pay a dime, um, but then there might be advertisers some days where you make a dollar or more per click. So it, this is a very much an average. Yeah. Okay, so some days you'll make more, some days you'll make less. Um, and so that basically covers what's in the Google Keyword Planner. Um, and the great thing, of course, is all these generated ideas. There's 800 ideas, and we could click on this column, um, and it's going to sort it you know, by search volume. So helicopter game gets searched for tons um, every month. And you can come in here and um, do different things as far as you know um, sorting, and then you can come back and filter. Uh, you can do all all of these different things. Okay. Is it important when you're using this tool to 
choose between broad and exact match if you're doing keyword research? Okay, so they're actually, if we go back to the first step, so if I go to modify search, well, it doesn't show it very well here. Um, but you actually do not have the option anymore in the keyword planner to select between broad, phrase, and exact. Everything is always displayed in exact. And you may, but you may have noticed here when I clicked on this pencil that it shows add keywords as broad, exact, or phrase. Mm -hmm. um, you can, so if I select this, okay, and then I put that in my plan, it's allowing you to add keywords to your plan, and it does all sorts of things for advertisers. Cool. Um, and so you can take these, but it never actually is showing you the search volume for broad match. It just shows you the different, perhaps, cost per click um, and impressions is what it's showing. So there actually is no longer any way to select between broad phrase or exact match. Um, okay. So this is a very, very useful tool, very handy. Um, it can just, you know, it can take a little bit of time to go through and sort out the different things. Um, you can apply some filters here. So uh, if we only want to see keywords that get 1,500 searches or more per month, and that only have high competition, uh, we can do that. And maybe we're going to talk about this later, and if we are, um, stop me, but I noticed in those filters you could set like a minimum cost per click. Do you usually look at a minimum cost per click, or do you have some sort of criteria? Um, you know, that is a good question. I. I usually recommend that people do set a minimum cost per click. Um, however, many times I won't, just because I like to see all the keywords. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm usually more strict with the search volume. Yeah. Um, but if there were an ideal cost per click, I would make it a dollar. Um, but usually now I, I put it at something like fifty cents, just so I see more keywords. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when I did that basic filter, we were left with, it looks like, eight keywords here. Mm -hmm. um, and then at this point, and we won't do this just now, but we would take these keywords that look good, you know, like maybe flight attendant school looks like a potential keyword. We would then go do some analysis on how difficult the sites are in Google to see if it would be easy or difficult to rank for. Gotcha. Okay, so this really, it is a great free tool, um, but I, I think there's a faster way. I created a, a keyword tool that obviously people are aware of, Longtail Pro, that allows you to do things a little bit quicker, um, mm -hmm. mainly because you're able to input multiple seed keywords at once and do all the filtering, kind of like you're able to do here, but then quickly just integrate into the next step of competitor analysis. Um, sure. Nice and easy. So, um, so let's maybe together, let's do, let's generate some some keywords, um, and talk through those, and make sure I have some of your questions answered, and then maybe very um, briefly we'll go into some competitor analysis tonight. Sure. So I will go ahead and pull up Longtail Pro here to start. And then we may um, have you do some, so you can take control. Yeah. Is as well, but initially I want to just go through it, uh, make sure we're on the same page. So. Sure. Okay, so we will go ahead and um, start a parent campaign, and. So basically what I want to do is we're going to just start at the top of your list and for, for now, I'm going to just do some examples. Sure. Um, when you actually go through this list, I would probably recommend that you start with the, the seed keywords that you find most interesting. So maybe those are the ones you know on this, things that you thought were cool um, that you didn't know anything about. You know, start, start with those because hopefully you won't have to go through all 50 or 60 of your C keywords. Hopefully you'll find an interesting one right off the bat, 
it'll be quick and easy and painless. Yeah. Um, but may, that may or may not be the case. So I'm going to just start, let's say, with five or six of your keywords. Okay. Just for example. And I just can paste all of those in here into Longtail Pro. Um, I'm not going to go through an entire tutorial of, of Longtail Pro here. If people have questions, there's different functions that you can do. Um, but for now, I'm not going to find exact match domains. It might be interesting to see the global search volume um, in addition to just the country. I've, I've got United States selected in our campaign, um, so that's going to be our uh -huh. local country. But we're also going to see all the searches done around the world. Let's apply some filters. So I'm going to put a minimum of 1,500. And for CPC, let's go ahead and put something here. Let's go ahead and put a quarter just okay. to get rid of some of the keywords. Uh, I'm not going to do anything else. I have There's a number of words here. I usually, you know, one word phrases are usually way too competitive yeah. anyways. So. I have at least two, three, three word phrases are actually great a lot of times. Um, so yeah, let's, let's do that. So we've got those six uh, seed keywords. Um, and basically what the software is doing is it does utilize the Google keyword tool. Um, and so it essentially is going out and getting all of that data from the Google Keyword Planner, sorry, that's what it's called now, um, and, and pulling back all those related keywords so that we can quickly then analyze all that information that we have there. So, mm -hmm. so it's going through here, and because we selected global searches, it's also going to go out and pull those. Um, it'll take just a minute. but we'll be able to see the keywords that meet our criteria. We've already got you know, 433 keywords that yeah. meet our criteria here, so we've got a huge, huge amount. Um, and this, this may be a difficult thing to teach. I've been thinking about how I'm going to share my thought process for looking at keywords. Mm -hmm. so, so we've got 433. Um, and so now the next step is to then look at what might be easy to rank for in Google, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't want to go through 433 keywords one by one. Right. That's going to take me hours, um, right? Yeah. So through experience, maybe intuition, and just some common sense, um, there's some keywords that we can just skip over. And uh, So I'm going to try to maybe share what I'm thinking when I skip over a lot of these keywords, okay? Sure. So I'm, I'm at the top nutrition data. I, I mean, I can just tell you that there's no way you're going to rank in Google for, for that. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I don't know how to explain that. You know, same with good nutrition or nutrition facts, um, and probably even nutrition articles and nutrition calculated. All of these, sports nutrition, food nutrition, you know, I'm gonna skip over. I'm not even gonna look at it because um, they, they sound very, very common. Yeah. Um, it sounds like very obviously that you know, nutrition data is going to be something that a government institution is probably ranking for, or a medical institution. Um, you know, I just, I sort of, I know that. Um, and, and maybe you sense that as well, Perrin, but for people listening out there, most keywords I'm going to be able to just skip over completely. Uh -huh. um, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean... And I mean, it makes sense intuitively that 
if it seems like something that many, many people are searching for and it has lots of advertiser competition, there's going to be lots of competition in Google for that term. Right. Yeah, and so <clears throat> it's something that as, as people go through more keywords and see what is perhaps common and what is obscure, they'll, mm -hmm. they'll learn a little bit. And so I like to look for more obscure terms, more obscure phrases, more things that perhaps you wouldn't think of right off the top of your head. So um, as I quickly go through this list, you know, nutrition for kids, that's something that's maybe a little bit different. Um, that's maybe one I would look at. Um, avocado nutrition, perhaps, um, is one that I would look at. Um, <clears throat> you know, so there's a lot of these egg nutrition, celery nutrition. Um, that I think once I dug into and did one or two, I would know how difficult, you know, all of these phrases would be to rank for. But it also just looking at it, I would probably skip it because it doesn't sound that interesting. Yeah. You know, am I going to create a whole site on egg nutrition? Right. Um, you know, seaweed nutrition. So. So I. I'm not sure if we're ready to, to move on to the next step. I mean, this, this is sort of how I would go through and look at this list and say, is this even worth looking at in Google? And yeah. most of these I'm going to skip over. Um, but then the next step is to go ahead and, and you know look at keywords within Google. And, and before I do that, I will give some, some tips and some pointers for sort of cherry picking out keywords out of a big list like this uh, again. First, like I mentioned, I like more obscure things, things that aren't as common. Um, I also typically do like three words or more. So I'm going to go ahead and do that automatically to filter our list down to phrases that have at least three words. So that automatically cut it down to 100, 181 uh, keywords. Uh, the other thing is uh, the use of adjectives um, within, you know, the keyword phrase. That mm -hmm. on, you know, like my best survival knife guide is a perfect example. The word best yeah. is, is that adjective that makes it a little bit different of yeah. a keyword. Um, so it, I was going to see if I could quickly see any that sort of met that. I don't even know what that means. Best price nutrition. Um, but that's you know that sort of fits that example. Of, you know, it's mm -hmm. got that adjective there. It's three word phrases. Um, no, I'm moving it to. Some other types of keywords here. But um, so those, so those are some of my tips. I don't know if you have any questions or clarifications on that, because I think that is kind of an important point. Because I think a lot of people will go through every single one of these keywords and wear themselves out. Yeah. So, say for example, we type in a couple keywords and we get a result like this, where you know, like the majority of this list is individual foods plus nutrition facts or plus plus nutrition data, um, at that point, would you normally just kind of cut your losses and go for some more keywords or seed keywords? Um, well, I wouldn't quite quite yet. So I would at least look at one or two of these Okay. Um, and, and kind of see. So let's, let's do that. Let's go ahead and move on to the next step. So let's um, say we wanted to, you know, let's, let's pick... What, what's one that's maybe more obscure here about a nutrition fact? Um, I don't know, Greek yogurt nutrition? <laughs> sure. Maybe. So, so I, what you then want to do is you want to look at the top 10 results within Google to see how difficult those are to rank for. And 
and I think this is going to be the last thing we talk about because it's a very big topic. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to leave you to start going through your list and finding some that, that meet some of this criteria. So when I look at the top 10 results within Google, what I'm looking for are a couple of different things. First, I want to know how well the individual result is targeting that particular keyword. So are they using the exact phrase, you know, Greek yogurt nutrition within the title of their page? Um, you know, so this first result doesn't look like it has the word nutrition there, but you know, it's got Greek yogurt, healthful. Um, and most, most of these are using Greek yogurt and nutrition somewhere. Uh, not the last one here. So, so there are a couple in here that aren't targeting it exactly. So that's a somewhat good sign. And um, why, why is that a good sign, Spencer? Because if the, the number one way that Google ranks pages is by relevancy. Okay. So the reason that we don't see the White House ranking here, even though it's, you know, let's say the whitehouse.gov is the most authoritative website out there. It's a government, you know, U.S. government website. Uh-huh. They don't talk about Greek yogurt nutrition, so they're never going to rank for it. So in order for a site to rank for something, they have to be mentioning the keyword on their site. Okay, um, it's a very simple point, but the title of the page is the strongest way that you can mention a keyword. So if you really want to tell Google what your site or what your page is about, you mention it in your page title. And so they give a lot of weight to that. So Google sees that, you know, this site is talking about uh, Greek yogurt nutrition. It's in the title of their page. Google weights that heavily um, and will at least rank that initially based on that relevancy. And does order matter? Like order of the words or like if, you know, it doesn't matter if nutrition's at the front and the Greek yogurt's at the end or? Um, it ideally is in the correct order. I think that that's the best. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not so significant that it's not like you can't rank just by having it out of order, kind of like yeah. we see here in this example. Yeah, okay. Um, how, how they're in, in some different order. But if you wanted to target Greek yogurt nutrition, I would advise using it in that exact order if it yeah. makes sense in the title of your page. That's going to give you the strongest, um, the most weight for that particular metric. Right. Um, and so I'm going to... I'm going to write down all these things as we go through here because I'm going to hit five or six things to look at um, and maybe maybe this is an important point that I read in one of your blog posts I believe from a long time ago that um, when you're looking at the competition in a tool like Longtail Po or, or anywhere really mm -hmm. your competition isn't everybody on Google what you really want to look at is those top 10 results. Exactly, yes. You want to focus on the top 10 sites in Google. That's where you want to be. You want to be on the first page. And so if you can have a stronger website than the existing sites, that's all that matters. Yeah. So yeah, you want to focus on the top 10 sites in Google. You want to look at the title of the page does it include the keywords? And if it doesn't include the exact keyword, uh, that's a sign of, at least some sign of weakness. Uh -huh. Then you wanna look at page authority. Um, And I like to see multiple results in the top 10 that have a page authority of less than 30. Okay, so if, if go ahead. Um, if someone doesn't have Long Tail Pro, can they use Open Site Explorer to find the page authority? Yes, yes, exactly. So um, you can go over to opensiteexplorer.org and they do give you five or ten searches every day I believe it is with a free account mm -hmm. um, 
And that's exactly where it's coming from, is from moz.com or opensiteexplorer.com to get the page authority. So in this particular example, and I'm going to try to rerun this, it looks like one of the results didn't come in properly. Um, I can quickly see that there are actually none that have a page authority of less than 30. So that's, you know, that's kind of a bad sign mm -hmm. <laughs> right off the bat. And, you know, if we need to talk more about what all of these mean as far as page authority, we can do that. But essentially, this page authority number, it it's, it's a very complex and very robust number. Page authority is extremely important. It's sort of where Moz.com puts all of their analysis into this one number. So mm -hmm. Moz.com, they look at the number of links, they look at the domain authority, they look at the Moz rank, uh, they even look at social signals, and many other factors are all implemented into this one number of page authority. Uh, it tells you how strong is this page overall, in general. Okay, and so this number, this first one has a page authority of 75, um, and it, you know, it's U usnews.com, so it's a very authoritative site, extremely, extremely powerful page, is, is what it's saying, which is yeah. why it's ranking number one. Um, and so to give people an idea, like I said, I like to see results of less than 30. Um, once you get over 40, um, that, that gets uh, pretty competitive. Okay, so under 30 is relatively low competition. Over 40 starts to get pretty difficult. So you can see that a 75 is just way off the charts. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, basically just looking at the page authority, I know that I'm not going to tackle this particular niche. But the other thing that I would look at is the juice page links. These are the amount of links pointing to the particular page. So the number one result has 306 juice page links or links that are passing some sort of authority or page rank or, or juice that are do follow, you know, that are important links. So they, they have 376 links total, but really only 306 of those carry much weight. Okay, so I like to see um, juice page links. I also like to see multiple results um, with less than 30. So in this case, there are a couple that you know, there are at least four or five mm -hmm. different pages that have very few links pointing to the page, um, but overall they have a, a higher page authority. So I like to see these two in conjunction. Um, so I like to see both low page authority and low juice page links. And for the juice page links, we're looking for page links 30 or below approximately because that's more or less how like I mean we can feasibly create more links on that ourselves if we're doing it manually is that uh, correct yeah yeah it's definitely we can do that um, if we're doing it manually it's also just and it, again it's not an exact science you know so if it has uh -huh. 33 or 34 that's maybe sure. okay too um, but the idea is just that the lower up links that they have, the easier it will be for us to outperform them. So uh -huh. that's really what we're looking at. So if they have zero, which some of these do, um, you know, very easily we could have a better link profile uh, than they do. But, you know, as you'll see, it's not only about the links, it's about the relevancy, but then it's also about the overall authority. And a lot of these have more authority because they come from strong domains. Uh, and you can verify that with the domain authority. Um, the domain authority looks at the root domain, so about.com is a very authoritative site. It has a domain authority of 93. This particular page on about.com has a page authority of 40, um, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. 
And then there's these other met metrics that you can look at. Um, you know, the Moz rank is very similar in meaning or purpose to page rank. Um, and to be honest, I really don't look at page rank anymore. Uh -huh. um, it, I use it a little bit to kind of verify the other things that I'm looking at, but I know some people like to look at it, so page rank is still there. Um, but then site age is another thing. Really, site age, if I see a lot of very young sites, sites that are less than a year old or something, that would get me excited. Um, yeah. You know, because that means there's new sites, young sites that are ranking at the top of Google, so why can't I? Yeah. Um, and I have one question. I don't know if this is too much in the weeds, but just to help me better understand how these websites on the screen are stacking up next to each other. Let's look at the mm. third result. Mm -hmm. So this seems to have a lower page authority. Um, and yes. very few, er, no juice page links and a lower domain authority. So why mm -hmm. is this particular site, do you think, ranking third? Well, um, part of that could have to do with how they're using the keyword in their page title. Mm -hmm. They're using the exact phrase, Greek yogurt nutrition, um, which, you know, I guess this one almost is. It kind of has the bar in between. Um, but it actually, of all the top 10 results, this particular one is using it the best, I think. Yeah. So it has strong relevancy. Um, but to be honest, Google uses really over 200 factors to rank a site. Yeah. Um, so, as much research as we can do, we can always. Uh, th these are the most important things. Um, yeah. There could be things like maybe it's just a better quality content page. Maybe yeah. the article itself is is better written. Uh, for however Google is analyzing that particular page, um, things like that. Sure. So so relevancy and probably quality content are having some part to play there uh, would be my guess so, so but that's a good question you know because a lot of times we'll look at these numbers and we'll say well you know based on page authority and juice page links these should be ordered a little bit differently yeah um, but the reality is is you know we don't nobody knows everything that Google looks at right um, we just know that these are the most important things that they look at uh -huh. um, as far as, as as we can tell so that's a good question, though. Um, so let me see if there's anything else. Juice page links. Um, I. Um, it's good to see um, newer sites. Um, I also really like to see other niche sites. Um, or affiliate sites or other types of sites um, other weaker types of sites maybe I could list all these out so uh, things like uh, Q&A sites like Yahoo Answers I like to see forums um, I like to see article directories and other you know generally weaker types of sites. Uh -huh. um, if I see multiple results with you know, these ranking, that would get me very excited. So that would be the ideal situation that we can find here, is that we can find you know, something that has perhaps not optimized as well in the title, has low page authority, has low huge page links, but is also you know, has a few niche sites or you know, forums or article directories also ranking in the top 10. Yeah. If you could find a keyword that sort of met that four or five criteria, you know, you probably have a winning keyword. So that's really what we're going to try to find here for you. Um, and I think I'm going to leave it to you to start digging in and going through some of these keywords. Uh, sure. To, to do that. So this is, I think, basically, I think a good stopping point because you've got a huge list. You can start, you know, going through these, and I would probably recommend, you know, the same filter criteria that I mentioned here. 
Uh -huh. um, you know, try not to look at every single keyword, but um, you know, try to use sort of the common sense tactics that I mentioned to skip over the ones that maybe look good. Um, and start analyzing the, the top 10 results and, and try to find some that meet this criteria. Great, sounds good. All right. Yeah, no, I think that's good. I mean, any other questions? It's, it's, it really is kind of a big topic, and maybe throughout the week you'll have some more detailed questions as they come up. Yeah, so um, the assignment, if people are following along, yes. is, is to, and maybe I can come back with, I don't know, how many keywords would you say, Spencer, that, that I think are good that we can look at together? Um, I don't know, just as many as you want, I guess. Um, it, it's hard to, I mean, if you can have um, between five and ten yeah. that you think are good, that, that's probably a good amount that we could spend some time together and, and analyze. So. Um, the assignment is to find uh, five to ten keywords that meet um, search volume, CPC uh, criteria, and um, low competition criteria. And we're we're basically gonna give you we're gonna give you seven days. Seven days. So people if they wanna set a deadline for themselves, spend seven days doing that. Hopefully to come up with five or ten good keywords. Alright. And uh, of course we can chat about it during the week and I'll be sharing the chat logs and emails and everything along the way but uh, for our next call uh, next week I think we're gonna spend a lot of time looking at keywords you've you've uh, found and, and we can analyze together yeah great okay anything else you think we need to cover um, I don't I hope hope you guys survive the storm hope your power doesn't go out again <laughs> yeah I uh, we survived here it uh, stopped rumbling out there so I'm I'm still alive, good to go. Computer's working, so good. Can't good. complain. <laughs> still alive. It's very important for the niche site project. That's right. If I go, it's it's just you. So <laughs> it's just me. It's a lot of pressure. <laughs> so awesome. Thank you very much. Hope you have a good night. And uh, appreciate spending the time with you. Yeah. Thanks, Spencer. All right. Thanks a lot. We'll see you, Perrin.